We are bringing you guys a bunch of buys and sells at the running back position. Earlier today, we talked about wide receivers. We were going to do these all in one video, but there is a lot of great buys out there this week. So we broke it up into two videos. Danny, let's not waste any time. Let's talk about your first buy at the running back position. Yeah. And I would plug my nose if I were you guys watching right now, because this is a guy that is pretty stinky, is on a bad offense, but the workload would indicate better days are ahead for Zamir White, running back, obviously, of the Las Vegas Raiders. And when it comes to Zamir White, for me, it is pretty simple as this. People were drafting Zamir White for the early season production that he would bring. He was going to get a ton of touches. He was going to carry the ball a ton. We obviously heard Antonio Pierce talking a very good name of Zamir White across the entirety of the offseason. But... The fantasy points just haven't followed so far. He's actually scored 6.8 PPR points in both of his first two weeks. But the reason why I'm impressed with what he was able to do in week two is we saw a big time usage uptick. Week one, we were saying like, oh, is Antonio Pierce a fraud? Like he was talking about all this offseason that he wants to feed his bell cow running back, which he's referred to Zamir White as. Oh, he's the focal point of our offense. He's our offensive identity. We want to feed him. That didn't end up happening in week one. However, in week two, over 60% of the snaps, over 50% of the team rushing attempts, and most importantly, 53% of the team routes. This was a guy that was viewed as a two-down banger. This was a guy that could be game-scripted out of games. That was a thesis that we had coming into the year. But if he's going to be playing over 50% of the team routes and actually getting some targets in the passing game, I do think he's a much better projection than he was coming into the season. We also have heard Antonio Pierce literally double down that they want to get Zamir White the ball. And I do think that's going to be the case moving forward. If these snaps keep up, Samir White should be in the running for 15 plus week two touches. If you drafted a hero running back team, Samir White might be the cheapest projectable volume in fantasy right now. Yeah, like I think prior to last week, I would have said Devin Singletary was, but then Devin Singletary had a great game. So you could definitely make the argument that right now, let's say you drafted a hero RB build and you were counting on Chase Brown and Rico Dowdle and guys that we told you to draft that haven't necessarily worked out so far. You could probably trade your bench Khalil Shakir or whatever receiver that you have sitting on your bench out for a guy like Zamir White and bank some touches behind your Brees Hall or your Devon Achan or whatever running back that you might have anchoring out your core. So I do like that call, especially for people that watch us. There's probably a good chance that you guys are maybe in need of some cheap running back production. The other yeah. guys that we're going to talk about in this video, definitely more on the expensive side, particularly the two that I'm talking about. Um, but I do think if you're going to go cheap, Zamir White is, is virtually free. And like, there's a good chance he might even be dropped in some people's leagues. Yeah, I mean, people are going to see the points. People are going to think about the Raiders' offense. People are going to see how good the passing weapons have been and think, well, Zamir White is just not going to be the guy that I drafted him to be. And people might have drafted him, you know, in the fifth, sixth, seventh round, but because of how reactionary leagues are, he might be viewed as a mid-tier type of bench option for a lot of people, especially, I'm telling you right now, a lot of the people that drafted Zamir White probably drafted him as their RB3, RB4 and just have no expectations for him right now. Yeah, no, exactly. I think he's one of the cheapest volume bets that you can probably get. And also too, like Minshew, Bowers, Adams, this offense is looking better than we thought it was going to. Like I, I said it on the wide receiver video, but I thought with Devontae Adams specifically, my biggest concern was like the Carolina Panthers, what they look like. I thought that's what the Raiders were going to look like. And yeah. the Raiders look functional. They don't look great. They're not awesome offense, but they look functional. And they just they literally hung 26 beat one of the, on the Ravens. They literally just beat one of the best AFC contenders in the NFL. So yeah, I mean, they hung 26 on the Ra Ravens defense that only allowed 27 to the Chiefs. So again, I'm not saying that the Raiders are going to be one point within the Chiefs on a weekly basis, but that goes to show you that maybe they aren't the complete dumpster fire that some, including us, may have projected. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my running back buy is going to cost you a pretty penny, but Jonathan Taylor, I think, is one of the best. I can, you don't really see often that in sharp and in home casual leagues, there's a guy that is a buy universally across the board. And to me, sharp league mates are going to look at the fact that he played 49% of the snaps. And even I did by that. And you, even it I was did. literally your reaction when I said, Jonathan Taylor should be a good buy because it was a negative game script. They were losing to the Packers in the second half. They took Jonathan Taylor off the field in favor of Trey Sermon and some of the guys that I guess they trust more to run routes and pass protect. But the reason I'm not worried about Jonathan Taylor is this. Number one, he had 95% of the snaps in week one, and they were losing for three quarters of that game. So I think it was a blip on the radar type of situation usage-wise. They trailed for literally every minute of that game except for 10 against the Houston Texans in week one. 
I also think that the Jenga piece of this offense is Anthony Richardson running and Anthony Richardson did not run that much in week two. And I think Shane Steichen is a very smart coach. I think he's going to look at the film and he's going to say, kid, you can't throw the ball like you threw it against Green Bay and expect to win. If you can't throw the ball downfield and make the easy layups, you should be running. And I think that is going to help Jonathan Taylor the most. And I also think that the Colts offense getting Josh Downs back, which I think he will be back this week, is a massive Jenga piece of the offense as well, because Anthony Richardson has no over the middle consistent production right now. They don't have a tight end to speak of. Alec Pierce is playing well, but he's a deep threat. AD Mitchell has looked pretty decent at times, but he's a deep threat. Michael Pittman is not playing at a high level right now. I think that Jonathan Taylor will be in a better situation going forward with this offense. Anthony Richardson has started like five NFL games. Like there's a very good chance going into week six, week seven, week eight, week 10, that the Colts offense looks more and more functional and Anthony Richardson looks better and better. And to me, I think Josh Downs and him running is how he's going to get by for the next couple of weeks. And it's going to help Jonathan Taylor get red zone opportunities because the bottom line is that is where Jonathan Taylor is valuable is in the red zone. He's not ever going to be a great elite target share running back. We know this now for the last five years, he's been in the league. I'll push back a little bit because I do think there is some concern there specifically because of what we saw in week one, because in week one, we saw him handle 88% of the long down and distance snaps. We saw him handle 100% of the short down and distance snaps. And we didn't really see that come to fruition this week. Again, I'm still on board. Well, which game were them. they more competitive in and which game did Richardson look better in? That's what I'm thinking. Steichen is going to be like, okay, we need Taylor on the field. That was stupid of us it to not do that. I agree. I'm just saying, I do think after week one, we could have possibly thought, okay, 88% of the routes, maybe he would get some type of receiving work. But I think honestly, after this week, my view of him coming into the season is about where I am at with him. And again, if people are viewing him as lesser than they had him coming into the season, that's when you want to be buying. I just thought after week one, maybe we could have seen a little bit more of a jump in the receiving game, which we didn't. Again, I'm still comfortable projecting him as a mid-round two-level asset. So if you can get him for round three price tags because he's only averaging 13.2 PPR points per game, obviously he's still going to be a buy. Yeah, and like when you look at who they're playing the next couple of weeks, the teams that they're playing, you don't want to throw the ball against them. The Chicago Bears, you don't want to throw the ball against them. You no. want to run the ball. They're top seven defense in DVOA against the pass right now. And the Pittsburgh Steelers is their next opponent. You do not want to throw the ball against the Pittsburgh Steelers. They're top five defense in defensive DVOA against the pass right now. And even the Jaguars and Titans, like they've actually been pretty good against the pass and lesser against the run. So I do think that Jonathan Taylor has some better matchups coming out. Uh, coming up. And I do think that Anthony Richardson is going to start to play a little bit better. He had, a, I think he had a bit of a rude awakening. I trust that he's a smart enough quarterback and Sh uh, Shane Steichen is coaching him well enough to know that they're going to adjust the game plan as he learns what he can and can't get away with. Last week was one of those games where you're like, you just can't make that throw. You can't do that. You can't, um, you know, all the things that he missed and messed up last week, it was learning experiences. There's a quarterback in his fifth NFL start right now. Yeah, 100%. This offense will be better. And like you said, the touchdown equity that Jonathan Taylor has in this offense is massive. So I agree with you in that regard. I do still think he's a buy, but I will say if people are thinking that maybe he can be a 88% route share player, maybe more of a receiving threat, that is where I think I would disagree in. However, again, even if you're just getting the goal line touches, the touchdown equity in this offense, he has a mid-range RB1 to late end RB1 type of projection regardless. Yeah, I still think he could be a high-end RB1. I think the offense could end up being That's good where I'll... he's a high-end RB1 because if he, he's scoring every game, he can be a high-end RB1. That's where I'm at with him. He's my RB6 <laughs> rest of the season for that reason. Yeah, again, I have him, I believe, RB7. The only difference I have is actually one of the cells you have listed later, so we'll get into that in a second. But um, ju I just view the weekly ceilings of guys like, you know, Barkley, A-Chan, Bijan, Brees Hall, uh, whichever 49ers running back is in the game as having a higher weekly ceiling than Jonathan Taylor. Well, I mean, every one of those guys is ranked higher than Jonathan Taylor except for Jordan Mason for me, so I, yeah. I'm not on any different page with that. Fair enough, fair enough. So uh, we'll move on to my second buy. And this one's a little gritty. This one takes a little bit of galaxy brain. I understand you're going to hear the offense that this guy's on and think, well, I don't want assets from the Carolina Panthers. But Jonathan Brooks is different. And again, this is a galaxy brain, but let's just paint the picture. The guy who drafted Brooks in your league, I understand he understood going into that draft pick, he has to be patient. He's not going to play the first four games. It was more of a long-term play. But since he made that draft pick, the Carolina Panthers have looked like an 0-17 football team that just benched their former first overall pick. If he is panicking right now, thinking that this offense is going to be a dumpster fire and Jonathan Brooks, when he comes back, is just going to be on the worst offense in the NFL. There's no upside here. 
I'm actually quietly optimistic about the Panthers offense. I know that sounds disgusting. You're probably watching this like, how can you be excited about this Panthers offense? They have literally looked horrific to start the season. Andy Dalton is actually quite the floor raiser for this team. And this offensive line has been playing a lot better than people want to anticipate. I mean, this is actually tweeted out by Panthers 24-7, but the overall Panthers offensive line unit has quietly been one of the more impressive units compared to expectation coming to the air. People expected this to be an awful offensive line, but the free agency acquisitions they made, obviously Robert Hunt, Damian Lewis, the two big-time guards, Ika McQuanu going into his third season at tackle, have really helped establish this offensive line. The problem honestly has been, I hate to admit this, Bryce Young, it looks like he doesn't trust the situation around him, and that was the reason he got benched. There was literally reports that in the locker room, the wide receivers, the offensive line, had seen enough of Bryce Young, which is why he got benched. Andy Dalton back there, veteran quarterback. When Jonathan Brooks comes back, I think he has an RB2 level appeal, and people are basically treating him in as a, uh, treating him as a throw-in at this point because they don't trust the offense, they don't trust him coming off the injury, and they know that... If they drafted Jonathan Brooks in the seventh round, eighth round, it's much more likely that they're 0 2 or 1 1 than 2 0 at this current point because they invested that capital into Brooks. So if they're panicking, they need to play this week. I'd be able to get a plus on top of Jonathan Brooks for like your Brian Robinson. And I would do that every single time. Yeah, especially if you can handle, you know, holding him for another. I would say you won't be able to start Jonathan Brooks, even though he's slated to come back in week five. Week, you week probably. Six. You probably won't be able to start him until week yeah. six, week seven, probably. So uh, that's that's where I'd be at with Jonathan Brooks. Make sure your position is that you're two and zero, oh and that you have depth, yeah. and that you can handle losing him. Like for example, in my home league, I drafted Jonathan Brooks. I'm one and one right now. I ran a hero RB. Jonathan Brooks was always going to be my late season RB two behind Brees Hall, but I lucked into J.K. Dobbins. So I'm not panicked at all on Jonathan Brooks. So if your team is in that position, then you obviously wouldn't want to be selling Jonathan Brooks. Conversely, but if your team is in let's say the inverse position where I have Brees Hall and I have no running back to right now, then maybe somebody would be sell, uh, willing to sell uh, Jonathan Brooks off for a Brian Robinson or somebody like that. Yeah. On top of that, the also underrated part about Jonathan Brooks is he has a complete three down profile. It's not like you're getting a two down back when he comes back Two down backs. Then we're a little bit more concerned about the offensive prowess in terms of game scripts. But I'll tell you right now out of him, Chuba Hubbard, Miles Sanders, Who's going to get the third down snaps? Who's going to get the long down and distance snaps? It's going to be Jonathan Brooks because he was an elite receiving prospect coming out of Texas. Yeah, and the other guys have looked awful so far. And maybe they look better because Andy Dalton has like a Mike White on the Jets effect of this offense. Once Zach Wilson was benched, we saw what Mike White did to the rest of the offense. It's possible that that's where Bryce Young is at in the locker room right now. But uh, regardless, I think if you're going to, if that's going to happen, you should buy Brooks before it happens, right? Because if, if Andy Dalton looks fine and he's going to be a, you know, functional stabilizing force on this offense, then Jonathan Brooks can be worth a lot more once he comes back than he was, um, you know, in the current iteration of what we've seen of Carolina. And I guess you can say that I can put, put him on this list in week three and week four. Once we have more information, I'm genuinely nervous that Andy Dalton is going to go out there. This offense is going to look like a complete dumpster fire and people are going to realize that Jonathan Brooks has upside when he comes back. So the reason why he is on this week's trade target show and not next week's or the week afters is I think the pessimism on the Panther situation is as dire as it will be. Yeah. And it's possible though, that uh, Andy Dalton looks just as bad as Bryce Young did and uh, they lose to the Raiders and they're not in a very good spot, but also possible that Andy Dalton, Mike White's this offense, like I said, and then your buying windows officially closed on Jonathan Brooks because the person who drafted Jonathan Brooks is like, okay, yeah, Andy Dalton's going to be great for this team. And Jonathan Brooks can be an RB1 by the time he gets back. So uh, Travis Etienne is the last buy of this video. And I think Etienne is one of these guys that is such an easy target to hate on uh, because he fumbles the ball when he's not supposed to, but he's averaging 14.3 PPR points in probably like a floor situation for Jacksonville. They scored less than 20 points in the last two games that they've played. They blew a lead in week one. The Bills, Texans, and Colts are their next couple matchups, specifically the Bills and Texans being offenses that can score. And I don't believe that Trevor Lawrence and this team are going to fall to 0-4. I think that they're going to be competitive. They have a good quarterback. They have a good passing game. They have a good running back, specifically in Travis Etienne, who was a, a top eight running back in fantasy last year. And Tank Bigsby's now probably going to be out for the next couple of weeks months maybe with the shoulder injury that he suffered so you're getting Travis Etienne a guy who projects as a mid RB1 always has always will in this offense that I think will start to perform better I think they're going to go back to the drawing board look at the tape 
what isn't working, what is. And what isn't working for the Jacksonville Jaguars right now is that they're trying to be a run-heavy offense. And that might sound like contradiction for Travis Etienne, but Travis Etienne is a phenomenal receiver. And if they yeah. throw the ball more and they're they're looking at Brian Thomas open every single route and they're looking at Christian Kirk doing his thing and you know whatever else, they're going to decide probably, especially against the Bills and Texans who are going to put up points, that they need to throw the ball more. And that's where Travis Etienne's receiving workload could come from. So some of the trades that you guys can see here where you can uh, you know, downgrade from Devontae Adams in case you're in need of a running back, I think that's a totally fine move to make. If you can send off uh, this one trade here, this Jamar Chase, Calvin Ridley, and David Montgomery trade for CeeDee Lamb, Travis Etienne, and lock it just as a throw-in, I think you're upgrading your starting lineup in that situation from David Montgomery as well. And if you don't need the wide receiver depth with that Calvin Ridley side of that deal, it makes sense. So for me, I look at Travis Etienne and I, I think, you know, this is, might be a hot take because my number one sell we're going to talk about in a second and we can maybe even just pivot right into it. I would rather have Etienne than Alvin Kamara rest of the season. You're crazy. You're crazy. I would still Why? take Kamara because Kamara is literally the RB1 in fantasy attached to a top five to 10 offense. I like ETN. The Jaguars are nowhere close to the same. I think both of these offenses will balance out to middle of the road offenses over the next four to five weeks. I think that's that the how, Jaguars that sounds like Tampa Bay Buccaneers copium to me. as far as how good of an offense there. That sounds like Buccaneers copium to me. Again, I agree that people are going to be severely downgrading ETN right now and people are going to be overvaluing Camara. But to say you take ETN over Camara, that, that's outrageous. I, I I really think that's outrageous at this point. I mean, you could easily get ETN plus for Camara, but even straight sure. up, if I was forced to make the decision, I would prefer that's ETN insane. Camara because the other thesis of Camara, and let's just pivot right into him because he is my number one sell. It's all about price with Camara. Camara is expensive as shit right now. If you drafted him in the fourth, fifth, sixth round and nobody's willing to give you RB1 or top five, top 10 RB production, then by all means, keep Alvin Kamara. It's all about price. So we always talk about, and there's a good chance you're 2-0 if you drafted Alvin Kamara because he is in a really, really good spot and he had 40 points this past 30 week. 33 points per game so far. He's been outstanding. But Alvin Kamara, this is precisely why you should look to tear up. Specifically, if you can get close to Brees, Bijan, Barkley, Achan, Gibbs, anybody like that. The reason for that is because Kamara is doing so great. He looks so great. This offense is so great. Clint Kubiak's a fucking genius. Derek Carr looks like an MVP candidate. I get that. But is that going to continue? Do we actually think that the Saints are going to be top five offense in the NFL? To me, I think they are probably more likely a top 15 offense that is overperforming our expectations for them coming into the season, but they're not going to continue to put up 40 points against playoff contenders every single week. And it's the same thing I said about Shahid in our wide receiver video. I think this is a great offense. I think it has a chance to be a really good offense, but I think they've been overperforming the last two weeks. It's all optimism, no pessimism on Alvin Kamara. He's still old. He could still get banged up. He could still lose some efficiency. I'm not going to count on Kendra Miller coming back to eat into his workload. His workload's probably fine, but I think the efficiency side of things, the second he deals with a tweaked ankle or something, is something that could um, result in it being worse. And same goes for Derek Carr and the way that the rest of the offense is playing. Fantasy football regression candidates, according to Hayden Winks, Alvin Kamara is right up there. He is like the number one regression candidate in fantasy. He had, I think it was RB10 in expected usage coming into the week, and he had 44 points in fantasy because he scored a million times. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I don't disagree of Alvin Kamara being a sell high, but I'm not selling high for ETN. Like, I'm not selling him for ETN. Again, you, you would need a plus. The market value, you should be able to get ETN plus for him. If and if it's right. ETN plus a significant piece, I'm perfectly fine with it. Again, that's my RB6 versus, I believe, my RB10, RB9 on the season with ETN. So I don't think it's outrageous with the principle. I just think saying ETN over him straight up is outrageous at this point, knowing that Kamara's market, man, like you said, you might be able to get any running back sans Brees Hall and Bijan Robinson for Alvin Kamara on the market right now. And yeah, that's why cool. I agree with the with the theory of trading him on the market. Because if you can get Barkley, HN, you can get John, you might be able to get Jonathan Taylor plus. Or I mean, if we're looking at that range of running backs, let's just say uh like what's another one in that range that we can think of? Um, somebody would be willing to probably give you like James Cook and Tank Dell for for yeah. Alvin Kamara right now. You yeah. know what I mean? Like that's where we're at. And I would do again with ETN too, it's like try and get another piece on top of them for Alvin Kamara if you can. Um, but it's also possible you're not able to do that. And again, and in, in that case, you hold Kamara. If Kamara is valued appropriately, the same with any sell that we talk about for the rest of the season, Alvin Kamara to me is RB10 rest of the season, RB9 rest of the season. If that's about what he's valued as in your league, then you just hold him. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that theory. If people are just devaluing Alvin Kamara, if they say, well, okay, you know, it's a hot start, but I need to see more. Hold on to it because at least for the next few weeks, you know, you got a top three to five running back in terms of where I'm going to be ranking them. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about price, right? If, if, if you had a stock that I told you was going to be worth 
10 days from now and it's currently worth $50, would you sell it? Like, obviously, that's basically how we approach. We're the fantasy stock exchange. That's how we approach yeah. these players. Alvin Kamara is a back-end RB1, maybe a mid-RB1 at the best-case scenario. I will fight back on one little thing with that is if you do have a $50 stock worth today, if you can sell that stock for $35 straight up, I'm not doing that. However, if you can sell that stock for a $35 stock plus a $10 stock, and you're taking a $5 loss with the concern with the pessimism and move go down to $10, I'm cool with making that type of transition. I'm fine taking a slight loss in terms of current value, knowing that when I'm projecting the future value, I don't view it as being on par with what it's currently worth today. But that doesn't mean I'm just selling it to sell it. Yeah. And again, I, I view ETN as equal value to Camaro. So it's $50 stock for $50 stock, except one I think See, is I going know. up and one I think is going down. That's the way I look at it between those two guys. Yeah, I would definitely need a plus on top. But moving off of Alvin Kamara, again, a running back that we weren't the highest on coming into the season. We'll talk a running back that we were high on and specifically you were high on as I believe he was the number one sleeper you had on your sleeper video this year. J.K. Dobbins of the L.A. Chargers. Look, we are J.K. Dobbins fans. I hope I eat complete crow here. I hope he's a top five running back rest of the season because, I mean, I love J.K. Dobbins. He's efficient. He breaks tackles. He looks like he's one of the best running backs in the NFL at this current point. However, given his current market value, he's a mandatory sell because he's currently a top five running back in fantasy football, and he is not getting remotely the usage of the other top five running backs. Like we're talking about him compared to the B. John Robinsons, the Brees Halls, some of the other top producing running backs in fantasy football thus far. He's doing it on a 53% snap share, a 40% carry share, and 53% of their routes. Again, fine usage, RB2, high on RB2, low on RB1 level usage, but he's currently being treated as a top five running back on the market because he's averaging over 20 PPR points per game. On top of that, people were so anti J.K. Dobbins coming into the season that if one hiccup has, happens, he has one bad game or he misses two weeks with a lower body concern, we know what people are going to be saying about J.K. Dobbins. He's injury prone. I don't want him on my roster. He's worth nothing. He is the volatile type of asset where if any single negative happened to J.K. Dobbins, people would completely write him off. So I would play at the inverse. I love J.K. Dobbins, but if people are treating him like an RB1 rest of season because he's currently a top five running back, I will be selling him for safer maintained value bets. And again, we see some of the, these deals here. Like if you can, maybe it's not, you know, J.K. Dobbins plus George Pickens for Hunter Henry and James Cook because I actually do like George Pickens. But the theory here is if you can move J.K. Dobbins plus a small piece to get to James Cook, I'm doing that every time. Can you move Deontay Johnson plus J.K. Dobbins for Garrett Wilson? Obviously you're doing that. You can sell him straight up for Mike Evans. You're absolutely doing that. Again, another one in theory. If you can take J.K. Dobbins plus a piece and go up to Chris Olave, I'm doing that as well. Again, that piece isn't going to be Jalen Waddle for me, but the point remains, if you can use J.K. Dobbins plus a piece to tear up into a stud asset, I think you should be able to. Because if people see their trade inbox and they see, oh my God, I'm getting the RB5 in fantasy plus a solid piece to move off of my Chris Olave, to move off of my Brandon Ayuk, my Jonathan Taylor, you should be exploring your options. Yeah, he's the classic two for one sweetener. And, and I talked about it in the wide receiver video. I keep getting trade offers about Tank Dell in our flock league. In my home league, everybody wants J.K. Dobbins. Literally everybody wants J.K. Dobbins. The nice thing is that if J.K. Dobbins is just a mid RB2 rest of the season, like we've kind of view him to be, you didn't spend mid RB2 prices to get him. So that's totally fine. I would say he's more of a shop than a sell. If you can get close to RB1 Correct. value for this guy, then you absolutely take what you can get for him. But if... Everybody values him as a mid RB2. And it's like Kenneth Walker or J.K. Dobbins, probably a wash. Derrick Henry or J.K. Dobbins, probably a wash. That's where he should be valued. So if that's how your league views him, then exactly don't do anything. Just keep your profit on your 12th round pick and keep using him. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it was a free bargain for a reason. That's why he you drafted him in the 14th round of your league. That's why you were drafting him in the 16th round of your underdog drafts. Because, I mean, this is always a theory where you're getting low opportunity cost running back to production and he's end up living up to that expectation. So again, if you can get RB1 price tags, you're basically turning in a guy that you spent a 14th rounder or a 16th rounder on underdog into a guy that probably was selected in the first two or three rounds of your drafts. Yeah, exactly. It just makes sense to shop him if you can. 
Uh, again, that is the end of this video. We've got some buys at the running back position, some sells at the running back position. Leave a like if you enjoyed. Comment down below any of your thoughts. Subscribe to the channel if you're new around here. All of our rest of season rankings are up to date. Head on over to Flock Fantasy to get those. Our weekly rankings for week three start sits and you know Vegas information, all that stuff will be up to date as you guys are watching this as well. So definitely check out our weekly rankings manifesto. You can also get access to that for free when you sign up using our sponsor promo code over on Underdog Fantasy FSE when you sign up. Deposit 10 bucks, you'll get access access to our weekly rankings all season long for free when you make that first deposit. And they have a ton of week three promos going right now. So definitely check out all that good stuff. But with that being said, peace out and we'll talk to you soon.